a safe deposit box in a major institution, uh, a banking institution in the United States would be the last place I would store my precious metals. I would dig a hole in the backyard and become a midnight gardener before I would do that. Welcome to Proven Improbable, where we deliver mining insights and bullion sales in the form of physical delivery, offshore depositories, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us for a conversation is Andy Sheckman, the president of Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments. Mr. Sheckman, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Maurice. Always great to talk with you. Last week, we discussed the prudence of implementing ratios as an effective strategy in identifying buy and sell signals in your precious metals portfolio. Today, we're going to expand the narrative further on buy signals and discuss the best values right now, what to buy if we see a broken down system, and a very important topic, protecting your financial legacy. Before we begin, Mr. Sheckman, for first time listeners, who is Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments? Sure, Maurice. Well, we uh, this February will be celebrating our 30th year in business here in Minneapolis. Uh, we're a family-owned company. Uh, we have eclipsed six billion dollars in transactions without ever having a customer complaint ever. Uh, we maintain an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. We're one of less than 25 companies ever approved by the United States Mint as an authorized reseller of their product. And in a federally non-regulated industry, Maurice, we're very proud of that that reputation we, we really are and an association with people like yourself and Rick Rule and other icons in the industry we're very proud of all of our accolades and of our reputation but the state of Minnesota where we're located care less about our reputation that's the only state in the industry in the United States that regulates precious metals industry we are licensed we are bonded and we are background checked everyone in the company from clerical staff to um, to salespeople to principals like myself uh, background checked every single year continuing education and compliance that's mandatory and a surety bond that has made most of the competition throughout the United States boycott Minnesota what it means in essence Maurice is we have a great reputation but the state of Minnesota puts an exclamation point on that basically guaranteeing the safest transaction in the precious metals industry Andy, before I interview, you made a valid point that really should be the theme for today's interview, and that was the central banks are preparing, and so should we. You know, that really resonated with me because all too often, many of us focus on the Federal Reserve and what their next move is on interest rates and how the secondary market will respond. Just what exactly are central banks doing and why? In the 90s, all the central banks signed on to what was called the Washington Agreement, Maurice, and I could never understand why they... They all wanted to sell their gold and, and so fast. And, and the central banks with the Washington Agreement uh, were limited to 500 metric tons per year, the amount that they could sell, so as to not completely destabilize the, the precious metals market. I remember that's when Gordon Brown from the Bank of England finished selling all of their gold as it approached $280 an ounce. Um, didn't make a whole lot of sense to me and to this day it still doesn't but there were four reasons that would have pushed them into doing that number one gold doesn't pay interest number two gold costs money to store number three the return is not predictable there's volatility but the, the biggest reason the fourth reason was the tier three asset status where the uh, the amount calculated on a balance sheet was only equal to fifty percent of the value and so the the denigration of the balance sheet the inability to sell uh, bonds and to transact international business by a factor of 50 percent would have made the central banks want to line up to sell their gold and um, as of April 1st of last year as you know uh, the reclassification of gold through the Basel III agreement to the only other tier one asset on the planet next to US dollars and treasuries has made the central banks uh, run uh, from selling gold, run to accumulating it. And uh, in 2018, they bought more gold than at any time in the previous 60 years. Last year, that number was up almost 90%. And this year, every small central bank from, from Central America to Eastern Europe is loading up on gold. They are de-dollarizing, quietly de-dollarizing and accumulating gold, unlike any time I have ever seen in 30 years in this industry. 
You know, when I think about the Federal Reserve, one of their claims to fame is that they'd like to be transparent. I, I cannot recall the Federal Reserve uh, sharing the information you just shared with us with the citizens of the United States. Am I incorrect in that? No, they, they don't. They don't. Absolutely not. In fact, when I, um, when I was a uh, financial advisor a long time ago, I was Series 7 licensed, which is the ability to sell stocks. That's back when people who sold stocks were called stockbrokers instead of financial advisors. And that all changed with the internet and free trades or $9 trades by Scott Trade. Uh, everyone all of a sudden became a financial advisor instead of a trader because traders made their money per trade instead of uh, money under management as an advisor. But that's a topic for a different day. But to, to this day, one of the most impactful things I ever saw in 30 years in this industry was page one of the Series 7 manual. It's about a 300-page book. Page one, you open it up and it says, and the, this was the only writing on the page, it said, the little man rule. And the little man rule is that the little man never wins because the big investor is always ahead of the curve. So I believe that the central banks were alerted uh, at probably uh, 2017 uh, at, and the meeting in, in Basel, Switzerland, they probably were told that in 2019 this is going to go into effect. And that's why they have been accumulating gold so voraciously since 2018. And no one's talking about it until they have properly positioned themselves that it'll become front and center news. And so you know, the old saying about it's less what you know and more who you know in life really is true a lot. And uh, I think they take care of themselves, they being the central banks. And the central banks, by their movements, are de-dollarizing. And they're taking this very seriously. Let me put it to you this way, Maurice. Gold was up 18% last year. That's one of the biggest movements that I can ever remember in a year and no one even notices it because the stock market was up even more and um, you know the the movement in gold I can tell you as someone who owns a precious metals company was not due to retail investment we had a good year last year but our year was characterized much more by large orders by accredited and institutional size investors and less by the average person in 2011, we were getting 200 orders per day. Uh, last year, we were down to 10% of that, but the volume we did was probably greater than 2011. All I can simply tell you is this, is that the 18% movement in gold last year, if I had a gun to my head, I would say is 99% attributed to central banks accumulating it on the quiet. And they've been doing it since 2018, and they did it in 2019, and that trend continues unabated now. At some point, at some point when the central banks have properly de-dollarized and repositioned, maybe it'll be more front and center news. But until then, that would crowd uh, crowd them out of their own trade. So they're, you know, it's the old saying, don't do as I, I say, do as I do. Well, that's a prime example of it. Well, Andy, I, on behalf of all of our listeners, the retail investor, the little investor, the little guy that you're referring to, thank you for sharing your words of wisdom with us because, again, this is the narrative that we don't hear. We see price movements, but we don't understand why and the rationale behind it. And here you have it, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we're truly experiencing a financial system that is breaking down and we have bubbles surrounding us. It's not a matter of if. What everyone should consider is when and how to prepare. Can a single individual take the same actions as the central banks are taking? Absolutely. It doesn't matter how much. It's just, look, the United States by its own admission is north of $120, $120 trillion in debt. Just between the national debt of $22 trillion and the $53 trillion shortfall in Social Security, we're $75 trillion in the hole. Why is that not front and center news, Maurice? Everywhere. You know, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. So why the hell is that not front and center news, just like the reclassification of gold? The things that matter about the future of our country are being glossed over in favor of trying to impeach Donald Trump for uh, for for trying to uh, have Joe Biden's son investigated, I, you know the the bottom line is <clears throat> it's it's a misappropriation of efforts 
uh, and of energy and of money. The things that really matter are being completely and totally glossed over. But when you look at at, at a country that is just between those two things, 75 trillion in the hole, north of 100 trillion in the hole in, in unfunded liabilities and things like Medicare and Medicaid and government, military and pensions and entitlements, um, we're, we're broke, you know, and, and like we talked about before and I heard on your interview with Bob Moriarty, he mentioned the same thing I did, the largest single asset in the United States is student debt. We have $3.8 <laughs> trillion dollars in assets of which one point eight trillion is in student debt, of which, as as he eloquently said, you know that people like Elizabeth Warren want the taxpayer to pay for. It. It, it's it's the biggest issue is we are a country that's that's financially insolvent, with nothing in the way of assets. And so the most important thing is to ask yourself not how much gold and silver should I own, but what exposure do you want in a currency that is effectively broke and the most sophisticated, well-funded and influential traders on the globe are quietly exit, exiting stage left. That's the most important thing. So you do what you can. You mitigate your exposure to the dollar. One of the slides that I showed at the Sprott Show last year, Maurice, was a slide from JP Morgan Private Wealth. This is the division of their company that works with the wealthiest investors in the world, the centimillionaires and the billionaires. And they sent a letter out to all their clients in this division that's created quite a stir in the industry. And it basically said that we want you to mitigate your exposure to the U.S. dollar through foreign currencies and precious metals because we believe it is inevitable that the dollar will be challenged at some point for singular world reserve status. Well, there you go. It's about mitigating your exposure to the dollar. It's about trying to um, take some of, of that dollar risk off the table in a non-dollar denominated asset with no counterparty risk. As Doug Casey so eloquently says, gold is the only asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. And when I say gold, I mean silver, platinum, and palladium too. But the bottom line is, is that you remove counterparty risk when you take possession of it, you remove the dollar risk. And then as our friends at Morningstar through Ibbotson have reminded us recently, that because of the interest rates being so low, the inverse relationship between stocks and bonds used to be called risk on, risk off. Well, that's gone because as interest rates rise, it kills both markets. And what they basically said was, the only asset left on the planet that has an inverse correlation to the United States stock market are precious metals. So you have inversely correlated assets to, or an inversely correlated relationship between the US stock market and the US dollar. And you see the most sophisticated traders on the globe doing this to not recognize this because of price and price alone is a huge mistake because that is the greatest tool of misdirection is price. Bottom line, Maurice, how do you do it? You just simply buy what you can, when you can, and slowly de-dollarize. Do as the biggest and most in-the-know and sophisticated traders on the planet are doing. You de-dollarize best you can as often as you can. You know, you referenced some some household names there. One I'd like to interject is Rick Rule, when he makes uh, his reference to precious metals, that they are payment in full. That's something we all should consider there. Precious metals don't have the word note on there. They're not an IOU. They are payment in full. Uh, let's switch the narrative from rhetoric to arithmetic and talk to the person listening right now and share some specific buying opportunities that you've identified that will maximize their precious metals portfolio. Because I find that all too often, most buyers don't take advantage of the premium fluctuations within their metal of choice. What are you and your most successful clients buying right now? Sure. Well, first of all, let's just talk about the pink elephant in the room, and that is the silver price. Um, there's no question, Maurice, that silver is the, in my opinion anyway, that silver is the most undervalued commodity on the planet. And uh, while we're still able to get it, there's very little that you can think of buying that is as undervalued as silver. Uh, what commodity can you buy that's trading at a third of its peak, 1980 peak? I mean, you can't think of anything that you can buy today, any commodity, uh, from, you know, from food to, to energy to precious metals <laughs> that trade at a fraction of what they were trading for in 1980. Uh, 
silver with the with the eighty six to one ratio, the relative uh, relationship between gold and silver is screaming to buy silver. So let's just say that it, silver is the best buy. Period. With that being said, you could also say the same thing about platinum, I guess, too, because the relationship between platinum and gold is 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 at its all time high. But I think silver has more utility. Uh, not only as an industrial metal, but also as money that platinum does. Platinum doesn't has, have the his, history as as money, but it's a great value too. But if I'm buying gold, I'm buying the twenty dollar gold pieces. The numismatic gold coins are as inexpensive or on par with, or only slightly higher than gold bullion coins, and and that is a price anomaly. If I'm buying gold, I'm buying low-grade certified mint state $20 gold pieces for basically the same price as a gold eagle. That is, in my career, almost unheard of um, in terms of premium, as you mentioned. It's non-existent. And in 2007, 8, and 9, those coins were trading at 60 plus, 70 plus percent premium to a $1,000 gold price. You're talking, that was the peak. But even in the 90s, when when gold was in the midst of a 25-year bear market, those coins traded at a 20 to 25 percent premium to gold spot. Now they're four to five percent. It's as good of a value in gold as I've ever seen. Uh, if I'm buying silver, uh, I think it's very difficult to ignore the value that we find in junk silver bags, 90 percent by weight, dimes, quarters, and half dollars. And um, right now, as far as their price. I remember when they were four, five, six dollars an ounce over the price of silver, and today you can get them for roughly sixty-nine cents over. It's an incredible value, an incredible bargain. Bottom line is, is that when you're buying gold and silver, Maurice, it's just most important to focus on maximizing what you get, but not crossing over the pennywise pound foolish thres threshold by buying too large of a piece. You always want to maintain good liquidity and flexibility. So typically, I don't go any bigger than one ounce in anything I recommend, typically. Because whether you're playing poker or driving on a crowded highway or just investing, you can never have too many exits or too many outs or too many options. And so by, by I guess you could easily say it by saying in this industry, by going big, by buying 100-ounce bars of of silver or 10 ounce bars of gold it's in lieu of a one ounce piece that loss of flex or, or the the savings that you get is not commensurate with the loss of flexibility so bottom line if i'm buying platinum i'm buying one ounce platinum maple leaves they're probably the best buy if i'm buying silver right now my first choice is going to be 90 percent junk silver bags if I'm buying gold, my number one choice is going to be MS61, 2, or 3, $20 gold pieces, which are amongst the cheapest I've ever seen in 30 years in this industry. Switching gears, let's discuss storage and protecting your financial legacy, because I believe a number of precious metals investors make a critical error right here. The biggest one in my experience is using safe deposit boxes at their banks. For the person listening, Andy, why would storing your precious metals in a safe deposit box not be in their best interest? Well, there have been a couple of banks. I think uh, Morgan Chase came out uh, and said, you're not allowed to store coins or cash in a safe deposit box. They're not insured. Um, and let's, let's pause there right there. Most people were under the impression because it's at their bank that it's FDIC insured. Please say that one more time regarding the storage boxes. Yeah, safe deposit boxes are not insured. The contents are not insured. They have nothing to do with FDIC. Furthermore, uh, if you were to have a bank run into problems or there were a banking holiday, they'd close it down on a Friday night. Uh, and you wouldn't get into that box until they reopen. Uh, not a good idea. Uh, also, the banks have programs that... Um, scour the obituaries and if someone dies and it's in the obituary those boxes are sealed until they are um, opened under you know for probate and, and what have you so um, it would be the last place I would store my precious metals a safe deposit box in a major institution 
uh, a banking institution in the United States would be the last place I would store my precious metals. I would dig a hole in the backyard and become a midnight gardener before I would do that. <laughs> All right. Does Miles Franklin offer a more efficient, safer storage alternative? Yes, we do. We offer several, both domestic and international. But I would like to talk about the international storage. And we actually do have a safe deposit box program in Canada, um, in Toronto, and in Vancouver. We have been given North American exclusive on this program. Um, we're the only ones who have access to it. These are brand new state-of-the-art safe deposit boxes where there's only one key. You as the depositor hold the one key and the only spare. Most of these, most people who have used a safe deposit box before will have, will remember the experience of going into the facility, opening up the box with a key at the same time the bank administrator will put a key in, you put them in together, that's the master key. And then you open, and then the box opens. With these, they're just one key. One key, you hold the only key and the only spare. Uh, our safe deposit box program is fully insured, but what's unique about it, there are a few things unique about it. Number one, if you Google basic questions and answers form 8938, you go right to the IRS website. And they will say on that website the precious metals held outside the United States in a directly held fashion in a non-financial institution are not reportable. Well, the only example the IRS has ever given as to what they mean by directly held is a safe deposit box in a non-financial institution. So, what differentiates our program? Number one, state-of-the-art one key boxes instead of two. The bank does not, or Brinks in this case, does not hold the master key. Number two, it's held in a non-financial institution like Brinks is not a financial institution like a bank. Uh, number three, it's fully insured, whereas uh, stuff held in a safe deposit box, box in a bank is not insured. And lastly, the way that we bill for this is by the ounce. Um, we're the only one in the industry that I know of that bills by the ounce instead of by the value. In other words, if you believe gold can only go higher from here, you have a fixed rate with our storage program, so it's non-reportable to the federal government in both FACTA and FBAR because of uh, the fact that it's directly held in a non-financial institution. The client holds the only key and the only spare. It is fully insured, and um, uh, you know I think the maybe the biggest reason to consider owning metal outside the United States, Maurice, is look at what the central banks are doing. We started out this conversation by saying the central banks are preparing, so should we, but what are they preparing for? They appear to be preparing for a dollar that runs into trouble. If the dollar runs into trouble, the first thing that the US government will do, in my opinion, is create or impose currency controls because the inclination of the wealthy if the dollar starts to slide, let's just say, as we've talked about before, OPEC says we're going to accept payment for oil in yuan and ruble, or let's say the the BRICS nation in, uh, the BRICS nations issue a new currency backed by gold, or maybe it comes right out of China, or whatever it is that creates panic selling in the dollar the very first thing that the U.S. would do would be to close the window of getting money out of the country because the first inclination of wealthy people in the United States would be to buy something other than that, that uh, from another currency. They would buy Swiss denominated bonds or real estate in another currency. But in order to do that, you have to first sell dollars to buy a Swiss bond or to buy a condo in Vancouver. By doing that, you exacerbate the inflation, you increase the velocity at which things happen. So currency controls, if things get bad with the dollar, will be the first thing that will happen. Having money outside the country, non-reportable, um, fully insured, in a fixed rate structure, in my opinion, makes our storage program the envy of the industry and non-comparable. There is nothing like it. Uh, to be able to have money outside the country that fully is legal and no one knows about 
you is and won't go higher in terms of its value, no matter how high the dollar fall or how high got gold goes based upon a falling dollar. To me, is 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 more much more than just storing your gold outside the country. Andy, for the person listening that wants to get more information regarding the safe deposit boxes, what's the website address? PrivateSafeDepositBoxes.net. That's PrivateSafeDepositBoxes.net. Last question. What did I forget to ask? I don't think you forgot really to ask anything, Maurice. You're, you're, you're thorough as can be. Um, you know, the bottom line is simply this, that... Um, I think if people are concerned about uh, things going upside down in this country uh, and you want to buy some metal to protect at home, to me, junk silver, dimes and quarters are the best choice in silver and one tenth ounce gold American Eagles are the best in gold. They're the size of a dime. They're clearly marked one tenth of an ounce. From a barter standpoint, if people are concerned about that, those are the two things to own. But for me, my main consideration when I am either buying gold and silver for myself or recommending it to others is to maximize what we're getting without decreasing my flexibility, never ever compromising my liquidity. The things that we've talked about today, junk silver, one-tenth ounce eagles, low-grade certified $20 gold pieces, one-ounce platinum coins. These are all as liquid and vanilla as anything you could ever buy. They will maximize your liquidity and your flexibility, never compromising them. And I think that if you follow that rule, uh, you'll never go wrong in, in, in this industry, whatever you're doing. So as always, Maurice, it's great to be here with you. I hope to, to do it again next week. And uh, We'll continue navigating this uh, this uh, sea of uncharted waters together. Mr. Sheckman, thank you, as always, for sharing your valuable insights today. For someone listening that wants to speak with you, please share your contact details. Uh, my direct dial is 1-800-255-1129. 1-800-255-1129. Andy at milesfranklin.com is my direct email. And as a reminder, I'm a proud licensed representative for Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments, where we provide a number of options to expand your precious metals portfolio from physical delivery, offshore depositories, precious metal IRAs, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Call me directly at 855-505-1900. That number again is 855-505-1900. Or you may email maurice at milesfranklin.com. Finally, we invite you to subscribe to provenandprobable.com. We provide mining insights and bullion sales. Mr. Sheckman, thank you for joining us today on Proven and probable. Always a pleasure, Maurice. You take care. Look forward to talking to you soon. All the best to you, sir. You too, pal. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.